the station. Any unattended articles are likely to be removed without warning. This is the Hour of History Cities podcast with your host, Stephen Bauman. The Hour of History Cities podcast, as well as other Hour of History podcasts, can be streamed and downloaded at hourofhistory.com, iTunes, Google Music, our YouTube channel, and tune in. Be sure to also check out our Hour of History blog at hourofhistory.com forward slash blog. And now we begin the Hour of History Cities podcast with your host, Stephen Bauman. Hello and welcome to Hour of History. I'm your host, Stephen Bauman, and this is the Hour of History Cities podcast. This series, we're talking about cities that supplied the world. And this week, we're talking about coffee that comes from Costa Rica. So last week, we talked about Mexico City and silver and money and how the economy was central to supplying the world, as you might expect. We're talking about commodities, of course. But now when we look to Costa Rica, we're talking about a much smaller nation. But we're talking about something that was traded maybe no less frequently than silver. And that is coffee. Think about it. Uh, Anytime there was sort of a great discussion happening in this sort of new enlightenment world, whether it was uh, the Parisian revolutionaries before they stormed the Bastille, uh, whether it was Parisian revolutionaries before they drafted the rights of man, or American revolutionaries who had abandoned tea in the harbor and had to find some other upper to get them through the day. People were gathering around coffee. Coffee was sort of a, a thing that people could find. There's great coffee house traditions in, say, countries like Austria and the famous Vienna coffee houses, the famous Parisian coffee houses, and of course, places like Boston. So coffee is extremely important in this new enlightenment world. People love to drink it. And very rarely did anyone think of the contradictions of sort of, you know, deciding this, the Declaration of Independence and the, the writing the Constitution and the Declaration of Rights of Man in Paris around this drink. This is happening. These sort of things are happening at coffee houses and people are enjoying a commodity that was produced by essentially slaves and, and forced labor in Latin America. So there's an enormous contradiction in this commodity and it's something I'd like to highlight. It continues even today. So when we go to Starbucks, there might be a picture of a smiling farmer on the wall and Starbucks might give 0.0001% back to the farmer in Guatemala. But there's an enormous contradiction in enjoying this beverage. And, and it's funny to see this sort of thing at like, you know, these progressive rallies, there's always free coffee being given out. No one really stops to think about this inherent contradiction. I'm going to focus rather than focus on the typical coffee narrative. A lot of people tend to look at Brazil because Brazil's massive in size. It's, it was the world's leading producer of coffee and it relied exclusively on slave labor. I'm going to focus on Costa Rica, which is a little different. There were dozens of countries in Latin America that could produce coffee because the coffee belt falls in the equatorial region north and south of Central America. So coffee didn't begin in Latin America, though, even it, even though Latin America quickly became one of the largest producers. It, it dates back to uh, the 1500s in Yemen, uh, when it's first being spread out through the globe. The Dutch sort of, with the Dutch East Indies Company, bring it to Guiana in Latin America. The French bring it to Saint-Domingue, which we now know as Haiti, and it begins to spread from there. So the actual coffee bean, Café Arabica, is from the Arabian Peninsula. The Spanish find out that coffee grows really well, and it grows well in places like Costa Rica that have mountains and valleys, and are also not too big, so they're close to the coast so they can ship as well. Unlike Brazil, Costa Rica had very little development. So Brazil was a Portuguese colony. It was the Portuguese colony in Latin America, whereas Costa Rica was not the focus of Spanish development. Like I explained last week, they were probably more focused on getting silver out of Mexico City than they were getting uh, coffee out of Costa Rica. So Costa Rica's capital city we now know is San Jose, and we can focus on San Jose as the city for this week because San Jose is in the central valley of Costa Rica. So although the coffee need not be cultivated in the city itself, it's surrounded by regions that grow coffee, and that's where the sort of coffee processing plants and where the coffee could be traded and sent out for shipment. 
But again, unlike Brazil, most of Costa Rica at this time was relatively impoverished. Cacao beans were used as money. There wasn't an African slave system in Costa Rica. Slaves did exist, but the number of slaves was enormously smaller compared to, say, Brazil. So there was also not much of an indigenous population in Costa Rica. So Central America in the 1700s and 1800s is very inhospitable for people to live. Think of like harsh jungle. There's lots of ways to die in these sort of areas. Um, and, and it is very hard to set up communities. So there's very small indigenous population. There are few African slaves being brought into Costa Rica. And thus, there's few immigrants coming from the old world. So there's not a whole lot of foreign capital. But what happens is San Jose, founded in 1738, finds out that people really like the coffee from Costa Rica. So uh, it's produced in a different style. It's called the wet style of processing coffee. And we don't have to get into specifics about this. But the way the pulp is taken off of the bean, it's different than it was done in Brazil, which leads to a more acidic, brighter taste. So people liked Costa Rican coffee and they use this wet style of processing in San Jose. The way it's uh, done is is you're only handpicking ripe cherries and it needs to be processed in these sort of central processing plants called beneficios. So it led itself to developing these central plantations in cities like San Jose. Um, Farmers worked with these processing plants and rather than sort of have the slave system where people are clearly being exploited, their labor is being used, and then the people who own the processing plants are becoming rich and the slave owners, there was a sort of constant conversation that was happening between farmers and the people who own the processing plants in the cities. So when farmers weren't getting paid enough, they would rebel. And uh, the people processing the plants had to figure out how to work with them. So they, they had to come together um, and and work together, but the people owning the processing plants continuously undercut each other. So there was no sort of uniformity in exploitation, whereas slave owners in Brazil worked together to keep the slaves from rebelling, and they worked with the state to do that. But in Costa Rica, there was a lot of competition among the processing plants because they weren't doing enormous amounts of processing. So it was easier for small processing plants to start. And as a result, the state ended up regulating relations among growers, processors, and exporters, and sort of creating a balance that was ultimately beneficial for Costa Rica as a state, and also beneficial for the production of coffee there. Uh, It also helped that the United States loved coffee, and the United States uh, wanted to, you know, get coffee from Latin America. It was closer, and they actually didn't tax coffee until 1832, which is right around the time that Costa Rica and the other Central American nations declared independence. So San Jose becomes the capital of Costa Rica in 1823. There's a very short-lived confederation of Central American nations, so sort of like the United States of Central America doesn't end up working out. Um, But San Jose is still extremely small in the 1800s, only 15,000 people, and it never gets to be a massive city. It only ends up today having about 350,000 people, and and the key trading partners with coffee are uh, United States. States and Great Britain. Now, uh, it's kind of interesting how this commodity from Costa Rica and how it's sort of like a selective or it's a tasty version of coffee um, makes changes globally. So it is a commodity that really changes the world and it's a city that changes the world because people want to have coffee that's from San Jose, Costa Rica, or they want to have coffee that's from the Central Valley of Costa Rica. And that became a problem because uh, people would, would lie about where the coffee came from. So people exporting coffee from Latin America to New York uh, at the coffee exchange that was created in New York in 1882 would take some beans from Costa Rica and then put a bunch of lesser beans not from Costa Rica underneath and say, this is this is Costa Rican coffee. So there's this era between 1882 and 1907 where it's sort of like a free-for-all and you don't know what coffee you're actually getting. And it's not actually until 1907 when the United States has its Pure Food and Drug Act 
that it's it becomes law in the United States that you have to know where the coffee comes from. You can't say it's from San Jose, Costa Rica, and it's actually, you know, it's it's not wet processed coffee. It's actually from Brazil, and there's some Costa Rican coffee as well. So uh, th this sort of thing continues. Coffee is extremely successful in Costa Rica. Interestingly, it doesn't lend itself to the development of the country because of the way it's processed. So it sort of favors small farmers and, uh, you know, various small processing plants, which doesn't lead to sort of economic growth that you see in places like Brazil. So Costa Rica isn't really connected. And as well, the location in central Costa Rica doesn't lend itself to development as, say, having a big coastal capital. And it's really not until the era of large scale banana production and United Fruit in the in the late 1800s that Costa Rica becomes more industrialized and on the coastal areas where the bananas are you get to see more and more immigrants from the British West Indies so a lot of Jamaicans end up coming to Costa Rica and it becomes a real racial issue between those in the central valley of Costa Rica and those on the coast and it's certainly something that Costa Rica continues to grapple with you know sort of San Jose not having any history of slavery so being a little less diverse than the places on the coasts that United Fruit and the United States had brought in to sort of prop up the banana industry because there weren't a lot of people in Costa Rica. So it's really an extraordinary place, the Central Valley of Costa Rica and San Jose, the capital of Costa Rica, that a place that only had 15,000 people in 1823, 15,000 people, not a whole lot of people, ends up being world renowned. So almost anywhere in the world you can go now, certainly in a place like Starbucks in uh, Britain, they have what's called Costa Coffee. Britain is a huge consumer of Costa Rican coffee because it's very close to a lot to British Honduras, um, which is now known as Belize and Jamaica. So this tiny, seemingly insignificant com country becomes one of the most uh, stable in Central America, in Latin America, and one of the most well known throughout the world. So I think it's fair to say that this commodity definitely shaped a city that definitely shaped a world. And that's San Jose, Costa Rica. Now, before I go, I want to have one suggestion for you as listeners of the show. One of the ways I get a lot of this knowledge for the Cities podcast is by listening to audio books. So for you, the listeners of the Hour of History Cities podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. Um, for example, I listened to Kofi Annan's autobiography as he was serving as UN Secretary General before I taught a week about Kofi Annan uh, in my course on international relations. And there's tons of good books like that available at audible.com. So if you want to try it out and get a free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash hour of history. So audible.com forward slash hour of history and you can get a free audible audiobook and you can support your favorite podcast, Hour of History. Thanks for listening. On Hour of History, it's our world. Anytime, any place.